Welcome. I'm a Vistage speaker on dealing with the news media, and we are so excited to have speaks with companies like PepsiCo, General Motors, Microsoft, and more about the intersection of business, technology, and media. He's a New York Times bestselling co-author of Trust Agents and a featured monthly columnist at Entrepreneur Magazine. And he's written Google Plus for Business, How Google's Social Network Changes Everything. Chris's blog, chrisbrogan.com, is in the top five of the Advertising Age Power 150. He's got more than 12 years experience in online communities, social media, and related technologies. Chris, we're so excited to hear about online marketing to grow our businesses. Well, I'm so thrilled to be here, and thanks for having me. And it's uh, it's great to be back in uh, the Vistage circle again. I've, the last time I was in Chicago, and then before that was at the Milk, and, and so now I'm happy to join you yet another way virtually. So thanks for having me into the game, Lori. Oh, we're so pleased, and I'm excited to hear it. And I looked at your first chapter online about Google Plus for Business, but I know you've got some other things to tell us, too. Yeah, we're going to talk all the way around things today. What I wanted to talk about is regarding how, how do we look at some of the underlying framing of using the social channel for all different kinds of things. And it, it's not necessarily that we're going to talk about, you know, here's how you're going to set up and tweet and all that. I, I have all those basic boring slides that people have at the beginning, including a bio. So I am a comic book nerd and a Camaro driver and a musician. I'm a fan of gin and bourbon, but not together. So that tells you Vistage friends where I'm from. One of the things that people are running into for problems with social media and the like is that you know, they're, they're trying to figure out even how to measure it. There's an oversaturation of channels. When, when I put out my book, Google Plus for Business, one of the last things I pre presumed would happen was people would say, oh, another social network. I just started doing that stupid Facebook thing that I don't get, and now you're telling me to go here? And uh, if you're feeling that, even being on this call, if you were here somewhat uh, reticent or uh, even more interestingly, if you're sort of the quote, the kid inside the uh, Vistage member organization who is stuck doing these things for the, the leadership, uh, boy, are we going to have a talk. Uh, the other thing people tend to do a little crazy is that they, they, there's sort of a whole bunch of expectation issues around this, you know, sort of if I set it and forget it and I automate everything, then I'll suddenly start getting lots more sales. And, I guess to dissuade you from that thought right out of the gate, uh, how does that work in dating? How does that work in you know, coming home from work and talking about people's day? Do you just repeat the same thing every day? I came up with this really heinous graphic. I, I have a really great graphics designer that I haven't bothered talking to uh, about making real slides for me lately, but I have this graphic that talks about sort of what I'm thinking as the four elements of what you need to think about when you're making your social business happen. In this, uh, the first element is to think about how to listen and ask questions using this technology. People on this line, I know, range from companies with a couple hundred million in revenue to people with a million in revenue, people with uh, very large organizations and a lot of people doing a lot of things, to people wearing a lot of hats. But I think we can all agree that uh, sales method-wise, one of the ways that we've always taught salespeople to do better business is to understand that the best salespeople are the best listeners, not the best talkers. And this is, you know, what this social web does very well is gives you new ways to listen and new ways to uh, find a uh, potential buyer by hearing what people are already talking about. Quite interestingly, just before coming on this call, uh, half an hour before this thing got off the ground, I was talking to somebody who was working on marketing uh, a, a very luxury product, and the product sells for over $100,000. And so he said to me, well, my buyer isn't even on these social networks. I'm not trying to get a 22-year-old to buy. And I said, oh, let me give you some stats. And I'll give you the stats a little bit later. But essentially, the first thing to dissuade yourself from thinking is that your would-be buyers and the people that you need to reach and the people with whom you hope to do business are not using the social networks. They might not be using them to identify as your primary customer, but do remember that the highest growing number of people on Facebook, for example, 750,000 new folks join a day. They're well over 800 million, heading towards 1 billion people. That is coming towards 1 in 10 humans on the planet have an active Facebook account now. The group that's joining at the biggest rate is 35 to 55 year old, uh, most of them women. Uh, but those are all the neat sounding facts. The depressing part 
for you is that unless your product looks like a two-month-old two baby, then it's a lot harder for you to actually reach those people in any kind of uh, meaningful way because they're there to share pictures and tell stories with their existing families and relations. We'll get into that a little more later. The other thing to think about is uh, learning how to tell stories that connect into the purpose of the organization and that also equip the listener for success, uh, and the listener of the story. So a lot of organizations are wondering, how do I take advantage of this new human digital channel? I hear that all these people are using YouTube and getting rich, uh, blending things in their crazy blender. How do I do that? We'll talk a little bit about communications. Some of you might be having that sort of twitch about, wait a minute, you know, I'm a chief, uh, I'm a CEO, I'm, the, I'm a business person, I'm into the marketing and sales part. This feels just a little bit like comms to me. Uh, to me, there's a, a blend that's coming or that's here, I think, uh, in this particular channel where customer service, marketing, and sales are all being done cross-purpose now. And I'll talk a little bit more about my belief in that, but some of you just nodded your head and some of you just said, oh, pshaw. So we'll have to sort through that as we get through questions. The other thing is how do you facilitate collaboration and belonging? Uh, a quote that I'm very fond of repeating quite often is that I believe business is about belonging. And people are always asking, how do you identify brands? What do you do that you know, will make a brand, make the definition of a brand make more sense, especially for a smaller business? To me, there's sort of three stages to brands. Uh, brand is sort of what you're known for, first off, sort of your repeatable met mention that you're known for, then it becomes that your, your second stage is a brand is what, you, what other people are saying about you all the time. You know, so if you are McDonald's, let's, let's just use McDonald's, the food company. So if you're a McDonald's, you're known for putting up fast, inexpensive, uh, quality enough, but maybe not high quality food that uh, is uh, beloved by younger kids and still tolerated by parents and older people. Um, you are known for that. Well, then people might who advocate for a brand like that know what they're getting every time they pull into the drive-thru at McDonald's. The third part of brands, the third part that you should be thinking about with regards to your business, is the idea that once people start using your brand to tell their story, that's kind of when you're in. And there's the really often repeated examples of places like Harley Davidson or Apple. We use Apple products, but it makes us the hero. We're the superhero who happens to be a Mac guy or happens to be a Harley driver or whatever. Let's go in a little bit more about the listening and asking questions in the service of connecting and learning. Um, one of the things is there's organizations out there that are doing things to hear what people are buying um, or hear what people are interested in. I'll, I'll give you some examples. I was going to give this job shout to one, but I'm not going to. Uh, Restaurant tours, for example. I sent a tweet um, just before showing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, saying, hey, where do people eat when they're in Milwaukee? Where's the kind of fun place to go? And I was told there's a few places you could go that you might try. Uh, AJ Bombers is a fun uh, hamburger place. Um, the uh, other place was, I, I'm forgetting their names, Swank, I think, was one of them, and, and the other one is the, the and something. But AJ Bombers was where I picked because it was just simple burgers and, and their motto is fun with a side order of burgers. And the people who told me where to go ended up being the guy who runs AJ Bombers, Joe Sorge, who then later became a business partner of mine in a couple things and we actually shoot a weekly video show together called Kitchen Table Talks. Joe has found himself on the Travel Channel, on Food Network, He's been on ESPN College Game Day. He gets lots and lots and lots of press and lots and lots of sales, spending zero dollars on marketing and advertising by maintaining a rich communications presence with people who talk about uh, coming to Milwaukee to eat, coming now to Madison because he's expanded his restaurants, um, and people who are talking about the culture and the community that he's around. He got there by listening. Chris, I can just imagine people saying, but I don't have time to tweet, and I don't have an employee to tweet. Can you address that concern? Time management is a really good thing to ask about, Lori. I, so first off, when people say, I don't have time to use these, uh, I say, so what are you doing with your time? What are, what are you, what's your prospecting method right now? And so someone might say, well, I cold call. I, I get the phone book or I get the list that I paid my money for, and I, I cold call. And I say, great, so what's the average time of your cold call? And let's say five minutes. I mean, let's say it's a really easy sale. 
five minute sale. So that means that person can reach 12 individual buyers, business to business or otherwise, 12 individual buyers every hour. Or I can spend that hour creating a YouTube video or tweeting or writing some blog content or whatever that one gets indexed into Google depending on where I put it so that search engines can find it. Two, that can maybe answer questions that my potential buyers are using as reservations to, to buy. It can handle more than one person's re, uh, reservations at a time. Um, I think there's plenty of time in a day to do it. It's just a question of how you're going to choose to use it. How much time should you spend in a day? Start really conservatively. Start thinking, if I had 20 minutes to even start trying to use this stuff in a day, how would I spend it? And if you tell me you don't have 20 minutes time in your day, you have a much larger problem than how you're trying to sell your business. Uh, Gandhi said we all have the same 24 hours in a day. What's to win by listening? There's a lot of companies out there doing this in very different and exciting ways. Uh, I know of an, I, I helped an ISP, an internet service provider, uh, with a listening project wherein which they listened for people complaining about their websites being down. And they said, oh, darn it, my host is down again. And they didn't really say darn it. And with doing a few quick search routines and then sending those searches into the person's inbox every few hours, he was getting actionable leads on people who needed something and that he could service and was switching those people from one internet service host to another. You can find that on all of these social channels, blogs, Twitter, Facebook, and everything, people's number one pastime is complaining. That's a beautiful opportunity if they're complaining about your competitor, and it's a chance to maybe win them back if they're complaining about you. Uh, for some reason, a lot of organizations, big and small, I mean, I've, I've had this from a really large car company, and I've had it from uh, millions of people who stand in line and wait to talk to me after a speech who then say, oh, but this one guy goes on there all the time and says I'm a jerk. And, you know, we, we focus on the negative person in our life a lot, but... Sometimes that person's an opportunity and sometimes they're just someone to move on. There's revenue in listening. I don't talk about listening because it's a gee whiz kumbaya thing. I make money by listening. Um, I'm right, interestingly, just a quick side note story. Uh, I may or may not be working with a large manufacturer of uh, porcelain products that you sit on occasionally on every day if you're lucky and uh, that involve water to remove obstacles because I sent the most random and strange tweet about uh, bodily waste. So there's revenue everywhere in this. The question about where to listen or where to spend your time or where to start doing this, I mean, first off, you've, you've got to wonder, you, I mean, the first time I help people figure out where, to, where their buyers are, the answer is almost always ask them where they are. Ask them in an email. This leads me to sort of a next, com a next point that I may or may not address in a later slide, by the way. But if you are not prone to asking your customer questions, and, and if your email newsletter, for example, or your email access to your customer is a one-way street where it says, do not reply, please don't reply, you know, at your email address.com, then why do you think that that's going to possibly lead you to another prospect in buying? I find that lots of companies send out their, their quote newsletter, which is mostly a ripped out catalog page of junk they sell, and they send it from do not reply, this is a total robot system dot com, and then wonder why that's not really leading to, to leads. So first off, ask them where to listen. Ask them where they're spending their time on the social networks. Ask them if they want to you know, communicate or converse via these platforms. You'd be surprised. However, in a survey that Citigroup did, uh, with people who wanted a daily opt-in relationship with a brand, uh, ages 18 and older, daily relationship with a brand, only 4% said they wanted that relationship on a place like Twitter. 11% said they wanted that on a place like Facebook. Google Plus didn't exist when they did the survey. And 91% said they'd rather have a daily opt-in relationship with a brand via email. Email marketing isn't dead. Bad email marketing is dead. Tools to listen. This is where you can save time, if time matters to you, or you could save money. If money matters to you and you, you can't really afford to buy listening software just yet, uh, and the price is very too dramatically for me to give you price points, um, you can do it for free. If you Google the phrase, grow bigger ears, I have a blog post that kind of gets you started on some ways to listen for free. There are services like Andy Beal's Tracker, which is T-R-A-C-K-U-R, 
uh, that could help you. And then there's bigger companies like Radian6, R-A-D-I-A-N6.com, which actually plugs into Salesforce. They were uh, brought into that fold. And I would say that that's the, the kind of going Cadillac of um, listening tools. What listening tools will afford you if you choose to buy them are uh, actionable daily reports of where you can uh, seek out prospects in buying new things. Uh, how to build a listening experience, because this is really important to your organization as well. What do you do with all the information that comes in? If you are listening, if you've given these responsibilities to, say, your PR person or your marketing person, um, but there's a customer service issue, you really need to build a, a very small, simple flow that explains that when it's a non-marketing uh, listening message, but it has some value to the company, that that person is still responsible for stewarding that message on to your, the group that needs it, if that makes sense. I, I found many companies will pick one particular desk to put the social tools on and it'll either be customer service and then people won't see sales opportunities or it'll be sales and they won't see any uh, marketing opportunities, etc. You really need to uh, decide that there's going to be more than one set of eyes and ears on these tools, otherwise you're just going to lose more opportunities. And I, I think I kind of covered that, so I won't talk about internal wiring. Just how to add it to your organization is if you're using it for lead gen, then just what you're already using for uh, sales management or CRM, you can choose to add a new field for uh, lead source and make that lead source a social network. You could do it either by all social networks, or you can say we're getting, you know, we're getting granular here, and we care that it came from Twitter or whatever. What in customer there service? One, Chris, I know you like Google Plus, but is there one? You just said email marketing is dead. Is there something that we should just avoid, like maybe Facebook or? Pinterest or something like that? Oh, so the opposite is true. Email marketing is not that it's the best. Um, I would say that there is no one social network to rule them all. I think every business organization I speak with uh, erroneously believes that LinkedIn is the place to be. And some companies do great with LinkedIn, several companies do not. Uh, LinkedIn has 150 million users. It, um, I think the biggest problem with LinkedIn is nothing to do with their technology or their plan. Uh, the biggest problem is about 140 of those 150 million users use the platform so poorly and they spam and, and just make it really unten untenable for most of the other attendees. Your buyer exists on a network that matters to you. So many companies, you mentioned Pinterest, so many companies are suddenly finding huge results using this brand new social tool called Pinterest, which is sort of digital scrapbooking for a lack of a better term. And then if you go there, you might look and think, I think this is the craziest piece of advice I ever heard. But I'll just I'll say this about that. Six years ago, everyone thought Twitter was the stupidest thing. And I've made plenty of hundreds of thousands of dollars for a bunch of different companies, as well as for myself, via Twitter. And I believe that Google Plus is the next big uh, social network to pay attention to. Not because it doesn't yet have the numbers that um, that Facebook has, but this. Google is the number one search engine in the world. Uh, YouTube is the number two search engine in the world. Google owns both of those properties. Google Plus is already being forced on you. Uh, if you have a Gmail account or you use several of the different Google products, you now must have a Google Plus account by default. Google has changed their search algorithms. And don't forget, 69% of people who come to your website or any of your online presence do it via search. 69% of that goes through Google. And Google is saying that we are going to start caring what social networks people are using and how they're using them and what people are recommending via the social network. So if you're not even thinking about a presence there, and this is in no way a big plug for my book, but I wrote a book called Google Plus for Business, 10 bucks you can decide whether or not you want to do it or not do it if you buy the Kindle version or whatever. So decide what you think. I'm not going to go with that. We'll talk about telling stories that connect into purpose and equip the listener. Um, if, there, if you were sad enough to have to listen to all the different speeches and all the different webinars I give and all the variants of a theme of, of advice I give, my number one piece of advice is be helpful. The offshoot of that is to make your buyer the hero. Uh, it's, we're in a really great opportunity right now where tablet devices and smartphones have outsold laptops this last holiday season. That means that many, many people have just opted in for a much more consumable 
type of media experience. They're saying, I want to lean back a little more. Laptops and desktops uh, permit a lot more two-way creative type work, but your iPad, you, you quite often use it for consumption or your smartphone or whatever. This means that people are looking for things to learn and pay attention to. And this, I, I've been telling people for a while now, YouTube is my instruction manual. When I buy any tool or product or service, I, I'm buying a lot of musical equipment right now. When I buy a new piece of musical equipment, I go to YouTube and I will almost invariably find some 14-year-old boy or some other quirky person who has made a much better uh, tutorial for how to use something than the manual and then the company usually provides. These stories equip me for success. I walked through a tutorial on how to uh, make a certain sound effect out of this, this music program that I'm working with and by the end of it I, th I felt like a rock god. I felt like, wow, I've got this to handle. That's the real goal you're looking for. I mean, maybe some of you sell a product or a service that is a little difficult to use. Maybe some of you say, for example, you sell health and fitness. Everyone knows the big problem with health and fitness is that people will buy a gym membership and then not use the gym membership, or they'll buy the treadmill and immediately use it for its real intended purpose, which is hanging laundry. Um, the opportunity there is to create interesting content that will connect people into the purpose that you're trying to serve in your business, and which means get your sort of message out there. But also, you can equip them in and around the product you're selling. Let's stick with treadmills for whatever reason. You're selling treadmills. You've decided that you know this is what you do. You don't want to just show you know ten ways to run at five miles an hour on a treadmill. You want to show, you know, should I eat before I get on the treadmill? How soon after should I eat? What's a good thing? You know, nutrition tips, for example. Seven ways to extend the life of your treadmill. Um, 101 ways to keep your treadmill from becoming a laundry rack. You can do this with most of your businesses, even service businesses, for example, you know, lawyers. The four things you could bring to the meeting that would save you $2,000 or whatever. There's just a lot of different ways to create content that matters. Now, I bet there's a bunch of CEOs, and I haven't been looking at the questions yet, but I bet there's a bunch of people on this call who are like, you know, I am not in the storytelling business, and I am not in the business of you know, I don't even know how to start making this kind of content. Well, first off, there's probably somebody in your company who does know how to make it already. They probably are like shooting simple point and click video. They, they may or may not have a blog that you do or don't care about for their own purposes or interests. There's people out there who are creating media. In this world where we keep thinking we need to buy a rectangle of space in a newspaper that fewer and fewer people are reading, Everyone is reading and consuming on these various social networks and on blogs and whatnot, and people are looking for information that helps them get through their day in a way that makes them feel successful. You have the opportunity to contribute to that and tell a story that not only highlights what you do, but also maybe equips your buyer to uh, do a little bit more. So that's something to look at. Uh, Rackspace is my website host for chrisbrogan.com. Um, I had to move to Rackspace because I was getting so much traffic that my site kept getting knocked down if I had a particularly popular post. But the story I tell everybody about Rackspace is how fiercely connected they are to customer service. And in my example, what I said was I sent a tweet, you know, dear Rackspace, my website went down, any ideas? That got me an email, a cell phone call, and really fast tie-in to their customer service department. Not because I was who I was, just because that's their brand. Rackspace's brand says something like fiercely committed to, so, to great customer service or whatever. And I tell that story to anybody I can just because it's so massive. It's just such an opportunity. We all want stories to, to precede us. We all want stories to say, you know, uh, is, I'm going to age myself on this, but the Macy's versus Gimbel's thing. That every moment where you can ever say, I'm Macy's, but the best buy in this case is Gimbel's, you should go over there. That story gives you such referral power forevermore that that's worth looking at. Speaking of referrals, a book to pick up and add to your pile is The Referral Engine by John Jantz. That'll give you another way to learn about telling stories, and they're the stories of referrals and testimonials. Where do people tell these stories? Well, I already mentioned that I think Google Plus is a really positive place to start investing your time if you're thinking about social networks. If you're not sure that your buyer is on Google Plus yet, type, uh, write down this particular URL, findpeopleonplus.com. 
I put in farmers and I found 1,400 or so farmers the other day. And I don't mean Farmville, but you know, real life people who till soil for a living. I was talking to a company who makes uh, very large aircraft out of Puget Sound and I looked up one of their potential buyers because they were telling me, oh, I'm sure there's no one on Google Plus. And I found 424 Delta Airlines employees of some stripe or another. Uh, and that was just with uh, 30 seconds of searching. So I found prospects right away, or at least you know a list to start pulling prospects from. I think why to think of Google Plus as one place to tell stories as well as your website or a blog off of your website is that Google indexes all the information shared publicly on Google Plus and it really enhances search results. So if you want to write the story about the best hamburger in Madison, Wisconsin, and you happen to sell that hamburger, uh, you could benefit by putting that on Google Plus so that the next person who checks on where to find that delicious hamburger will find you. What kinds of tools are people using? I mean, this is where a couple things happen. Usually people get a little bit uh, glossy-eyed because they think, I don't want to write a blog. I don't even like the name of a blog. You could just say website updates. You can say news. You can, you can call it articles. You can call it whatever you want. Blog is one of those stupid words that someone came up with that we're all stuck using. You can make video. Every one of you probably has a point and shoot camera that shoots video as well or your smartphone shoots video. You have the tools to do it simply as it stands right now. Newsletters. I, I started by saying that uh, email marketing isn't dead but bad email marketing is dead. It's important to realize that there's a lot of uh, really good opportunity in sending really good newsletters that connect with people. Um, not to plug myself, but if you go to humanbusinessworks.com, there's a sign-up form there to sign up for mine. You'll see a very unique take on how to build newsletters. Uh, and all the various social networks that you could use. <clears throat> people are telling stories in 140 characters, believe it or not, on Twitter. <clears throat> Twitter is starting to rebrand itself as a very personalized and personalizable, I know that's not a word, news feed. And it's true. If you have an interest, say, for example, uh, Autism Month is coming up in April and you want to follow people that are advocates for autism and the like, you can do that quite easily via places like Twitter and get meaningful conversations. How do these stories best serve your goals? Well, I guess it depends what you're looking to do. Do you need more buyers? Do you need more passionate people to care about your product? Do you need more testimonials? You want to design your stories to serve those goals. You also want to really tr try hard to make your buyer the hero in the story. If you've read, if you've received a press release lately, have you ever looked at a press release in the last 20 days and thought, wow, this is great. I, I feel so informed now. Press releases uh, and, and, and information where you tout yourself as the, the big winner and the big hero comes off like you're bragging about yourself. And it's not that I'm saying be humble. It's not that I'm pushing you that way. What I'm saying is instead of bragging about yourself, wouldn't it be cool to brag about the customer who's benefited the most from that brag? So if you're the award-winning installer of HVAC systems, wouldn't you want to talk about such and such, the building owner who saved 25% and you know, really turned around his books or something. I mean, I'm making the story up, but the, you, I think you hear the underlying plan there. How do you make it so that the buyer's the hero? When you think about internal wiring for this, again, it depends on the size of your business, but <clears throat> you do have to consider things like editorial calendar. And when I say that, I really just mean if you're planning to write a story once a week or shoot a video once a week or whatever you're going to do, what are you going to talk about? How are you going to keep in mind what you've already talked about? Do you need an approval process? Perhaps you have a series of restaurants or a series of uh, oil change companies or whatever your, your, your vintage business of choice is. Maybe what you need to do is have some very loose guidelines on how to approve what does or doesn't get shared. I will tell you that a, um, America's favorite family neighborhood restaurant chain uh, had a system in place to kind of make sure that hosts and servers and whatnot from their restaurants uh, kept it within that brand mindset of being America's family restaurant and they were doing a shoot us and send us photos of your beach uh, experiences competition and somebody decided that a family restaurant would be a great place to show their wet t-shirt photos. Thankfully uh, this organization had some, some uh, roadblocks in place that allowed for a quick review of what content went to the web before it went up. Now, that's a pretty extreme example. Uh, there are more scary stories of putting bullets in the gun so you could shoot your own foot than I could shake a stick at. 
I will tell you the opposite side of that story is that the more you put roadblocks between your employees and putting stuff out on the web, the less interested they are in doing it. Uh, I, I can tell you that from my own experience. I just turned down uh, just about five figures for doing what would have been about 40 minutes of work because the process by which I had to get it approved just seemed less fun than it was to find another way to make that money. So I just didn't do it. Um, I think I went through some st topics for storytelling, so I'm going to skip that slide and we're going to move on to enhancing the communications back plane. This is the internal stuff, but it's also thinking about sharing on your site. There's a few things to think about. Your main website should primarily have conversion in mind, whatever that conversion means. Your prime website should inform people enough that they say, oh, I am ready to take a next step. A really interesting test you can do during or after this call is look at your primary website and tell me if you know or can explain or articulate to me what I'm supposed to do next when I go to your website and how that's going to lead to a conversion. The more scary one is if you let me squint my eyes and look at your website from across the room, would I know what button you really want me to push the most? Well, in enhancing the communications backplane, I'm giving you sort of conflicting advice or potentially conflicting advice because the other thing what you want to do is you want to think about whether or not or how people can share what they find on your site out to their social networks. There's a real lot of negative example of how this can be done. I, I, I find countless small businesses saying, like us on Facebook. What I see when I see like us on Facebook Let's use the human equivalent to that. Let's imagine you and I go to a Vistage Mixer, and I show up, and you're there, and you're like happy to see me, and I shake your hand. I say, oh, you know, I'm so happy to meet you. By the way, can you do me a favor? Here's a handful of my business cards. I want you to walk around to everybody else that you know here and that you've made a relationship with, and I want you to point out to who they are, and I want you to hand them one of my business cards and say, you know, I, I like Chris Brogan. I thought you might want to as well. This sounds okay like as a marketing transaction, but it is not okay. Uh, as a trust transition, you know, people aren't necessarily excited to hear, you know, who you've built a relationship with unless it's going to help that person. So in thinking about this particular element, in, in thinking about how do you enhance the communications backlane, how do you get more people uh, using social tools, you want to think on one side, how can people best uh, pick up and run with the story that you want to share with them? And also, how can people interact with you in a two-way street? I mean, that's kind of why the graphic is just an arrow back and forth, is that it's a two-way kind of an interaction. Dell Computer is doing some really interesting stuff with this. On Google+, Plus, Michael Dell, the chairman, shows up in live video hangouts all the time. Now, Michael's been blogging and using other social media for years. And what's interesting is, of course, he gets pe certain people say, oh, I don't even think he writes his own stuff. Well, here's a trick. He can't uh, not show up for his own video hangout because it would be pretty obvious that it wouldn't be Michael Dell sitting in the seat. Well, he shows up and does these really quick, uh, deep conversations with people about things in the consumer computer marketplace quite often. And the people who drop in to have conversations with him have been interesting. The first time I observed this, by the way, the next person who joined after Michael Dell started the conversation was Google co-founder Sergey Brin. And I thought, wow, for tech nerds, this would be nirvana. I mean, Bill Gates would have to join third, I guess, and then we'd have everybody. They're also, Dell is quite actively using uh, Twitter to do customer service work, Twitter to show off deals. And, and the interesting backstory to, to, to using Twitter to show off their deals was they asked the people that were already following their non-salesy conversations on Twitter, what did, what did those people want? Do you want us to share deals on our non-salesy accounts, you know, our sort of normal names like Richard at Dell, or do you think we should build something like Dell Bargain Outlet online? The minute they started Dell Bargain Outlet on Twitter, they showed a five million dollar revenue uh, booking of Twitter only sales that they put up just by tweeting various things like, you know, we have monitors for sale today. Their price point is around two hundred dollars a unit on average, so um, they made five million at two hundred bucks a pop when they turned on that backplane in Twitter. There's something to be concerned about with this, which is that the more places you decide to build a social presence, it's almost like turning on a new phone. And you're saying, well, I'm here, so you can try to reach me here if you want. You run the risk of not responding to people and them having that sense of, you know, hey, you said you were here and you're not, and I, don't, I didn't hear from you, so I think you're a jerk. 
you can choose where you want to be. I mean, Lori asked the question, is there one social network to rule them all? And I, I hopefully dodged that as well as I could by saying, no, not really. Um, but you can choose and say that I'm going to spend my most time on Twitter or I'm going to, I'm going to be more available via my blog or just send me an email. There is no really right choice. It's just what you educate your buyers and your prospects to spend time looking at. Uh, however, you are turning up more phones. The question just then becomes, what are you going to do with them? And, and are they phones that bring you more opportunity, more chances to fix something, or are they phones that uh, just did, you're engaged in chitty chat? When people say they have no time for social media, you could replace the word social media with telephone, and I'd ask, do you have time to use your telephone? If the answer is yes, then you have time for social media. It's the same device. It's just 100 years different on what the tech does, and it changes the game by how many people you can reach at once. Where are people communicating or not communicating? Well, it's strange to note that Twitter is a place where there's been a lot of success stories. Comcast, the uh, customer uh, cable company, had a strong, strong bunch of positive responses of customer service by starting Comcast Cares on Twitter. This is a great time to point out, by the way, that 67% of enterprise social network use uh, was was launched by Guerrilla Methods, meaning without the company's approval, as Comcast Cares was. I see lots of doctors, you know, medical physicians talking on there, health practitioners, legal people, and they're not all day selling. I mean, that's the one thing you have to realize is that when people are using these platforms like Twitter or Google Plus or their blog, selling all the time isn't really going to help you find any buyers. I mean, your best educated seller or you yourself know that you find rapport, you learn about the other person, you listen, and then you look for an opportunity. It doesn't change. This is the same deal. The other thing is there's a lot more opportunity here. Some of you on the call use Skype already. There's tools inside of Google Plus, for example, Google Hangout. Google Hangout allows coaches to do uh, virtual one-to-many coaching for up to nine other people. You can use Google Hangout to do uh, back and forth conversations and meetings instead of buying a telepresent system because it's free and also private enough. The um, tools like Twitter allow you for fast messaging back and forth without having to give away a phone number. So for example, say you had a kid and you didn't really want them to text every old person, you maybe you'd train them to use a Twitter account or an instant messenger client or something like that so that it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation. There's a lot of ways to think of social tech or just as just new communications tools, I guess, is my point. Please definitely don't uh, un underestimate that. I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time for one thing, and then two, I think I've handled most of these. I, I do want to talk about this really quickly. I I've mentioned a few times that email marketing is alive and well. Um, we look down at our little three-inch device more often than you think. How many people on this call with me right now sleep with your phone right next to your head as if you were either a superhero or a brain surgeon. Uh, the number is higher than you think, by the way. And for those of you who giggled, it's because it's true. And I do the same thing. And you know, I used to work in a 24-7 environment where it did matter that I got a phone call, but it's been a long time since. Um, we use our phones. We check email very first thing in the morning, etc. So if we still are dependent on email in the supposedly advanced world where social networking and text messaging is going to replace it all, then why do we all still check email? It's, it's because it's still vital. But how do we make it good? Brevity. No one has time for a 1,400-word uh, email, let alone a 700-word email. Try to keep it to below 300 words. One call to action per mail. Uh, the companies like Groupon that exist, exist because they've mastered the idea of one call to action per day per mail. Uh, the other thing is remove all the amazingly great-looking HTML formatting. It's not helping anybody. It's making it look less personal, and it's making it look like a form letter. Uh, consider not having all the beautiful headers and sidebars and incredible video click links and all that. Consider making a message that actually connects with a human. Moving on, I just want to talk really quickly about collaboration and belonging, and then we'll have a, a little bit of time for some questions. Um, there are all these things like mind storms, idea storms, digital nomads, and Red Hat, these are all these organizations that have let open this thing called crowdsourcing, which James Sirwicky wrote a book years ago called Wisdom of Crowds, which to me almost 
feels quaint because I think more and more companies are doing crowdsourcing. This idea of allowing company, uh, allowing collaboration to, to be a little more porous and go beyond the front door. Um, Dell's idea storms is allowing people to uh, vote up or down problems they're having with Dell products and allow them to choose what they want to do differently about them. Lego Mindstorms allowed the community of Lego robot enthusiasts to vote on what kinds of new features and forms they wanted. It seems like a lot more of that is happening out there in the industry and it works well if people feel that you are passionate about making them the hero. It does not work well if you are doing the Tom Sawyer trick of saying, hmm, painting this fence sure is hard, but it's great. I'm enjoying it and it's a lot of fun and getting everybody else to paint your fence for you. Red Hat, by the way, is the company has made over $1 billion selling a free piece of software, so I think they deserve some credit for that. What Red Hat has done is that they've had their community design their new logo and branding for one of their very beloved products, Fedora, and the way they did that was that they had their lawyers uh, join the community and communicate as if they were collaborators and not lawyers being lawyerly. And the whole thing really turned out to be, uh, for one, ridiculously cost effective, but two, uh, very rewarding for the people who love it. We'll skip that. Collaboration works best when organizations uh, really care about the, the result. And if you don't, it's okay, just don't do that. Don't offer that service. We have this uh, feeling sometimes where you know, you'll hear about some new marketing or sales idea and you'll think, oh, I should do that, but it doesn't fit your culture. I hereby grant you permission to skip it. But when collaboration does work best, the opportunity is that people can share and, and make something their own and really add some value and bring it back to the system. Some of your organizations uh, account for that and some of you don't. You might think about this because to me this is another place where the frontier is around us when there's business opportunity. Winding down a little bit, the, the face of collaboration technology, again, I'm just trying to make a plug to go take a look at Google Plus because it allows you to share text, photos, videos, um, location data, and all that kind of stuff in a very simple way. And the comments that you see back from people are fast. But you can look at Pinterest as collaboration technology. Pinterest is, you know, if you if you were trying out to be more health conscious and you want to eat more. I don't know, raw vegan food, you can put in raw vegan and find tons of people. If you want to find great chili recipes for March Madness, you can find thousands of them. There's all kinds of ways to do that. We talked about Tom Sawyer. The only thing is if you're going to put collaboration and belonging into your organization, you definitely need to bring everybody to the table. It can't be a gee whiz neato thing that your marketer uh, decided they were going to do, and it can't be a contest. Um, contest, by the way, is almost equivalent to dance monkey dance and sometimes contests are great and sometimes they drive great value but I, I challenge you with this when you use contests to build lead generation or when you use contests to build awareness or, or early buy-in do those customers ever stick around or are they ever loyal my guess is not so true and uh, one last thing uh, vanilla ice said at first he said stop collaborate and listen and I will say that that's what we also covered in this and now Lori and all and I've left a little bit of time for some questions, but you can also contact me right there at chrisbrogan.com slash contact, which is a nifty little form that I actually respond to and uh, get back to you as soon as I can, too. Well, Chris, this is fascinating, fascinating information, and I think we've learned a lot, but we have lots of questions. Why don't we see how many we can get to in the next 10 minutes or so? Uh, Mike asked a question, any statistics on how social media improves your website search engine optimization? Uh, there's tons. I, I, if you Google uh, the impact of social media on SEO, which is search engine optimization, you'll find lots of uh, things about that. The blending of social and search. Well, let, let, me, let me give you an anecdotal story that might just answer that fast. Is The second day that Google Plus opened, Danny Sullivan, who runs Search Engine Land, and Rand Fishkin, who runs SEO Moz, and... Um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to blank on his name. Andy, who uh, or Adam, who runs the other SEO uh, site of uh, Aaron Wall SEO book, we're all on Google Plus and all very actively trying to take apart and understand how it works. Um, there is absolutely search engine optimization uh, value and statistics in uh, using the social web to augment your efforts. 
um, the storyline I give people is that if you are just doing SEO but you are not doing search social, that is like taking a ton of supplements and incredible whey protein and then sitting on your couch and wondering why your muscles aren't bigger. <laughs> We've had a couple of people ask about being concerned about spamming. If you find somebody online or if you send too many email messages, would that be considered spamming? Yes, um, the definition of spam, unfortunately, is always what I feel, not what you were intending. And so you can, there, in Dell's early days, somebody would say, wow, I'm having this little trouble with my latitude. And like 40 Dell employees would jump on that person and be like, I can help. And it was overwhelming and scary. Um, if your organization doesn't necessarily have a couple hundred people using Twitter, you're probably safe. Uh, as far as sending messages, uh, it comes with setting the expectation and it comes with delivering value. If you're sending me a daily message that is selling your junk and that's all it's doing, then it's spam to me. If you're sending me a daily message that's providing me value by showing me a product or service that you provide that would really help me change my world, wow, there's some value. You have to really kind of work on that one though. There's no, there's no like rule of thumb or something like that. But I would say that um, you know, if, it, if you feel a little desperate while you're typing it, it's going to come out really desperate and it, it'll be like 10 times more desperate on the other side of the reception of that. So, What else, Lori? Well, there's a question about ROI. Any tools to measure and quantify which of the social networks online tools are giving you the most um, bang for the buck? I love that question, especially the I part, because most people invest zero, uh, so the return is always... <laughs> exponentially really good because the tools are free. Um, you, you invest time. Um, what, you're, what you want to do to start thinking about ROI is you have to break the process down into what's, what goal are you going to pursue with it. Let's say it's lead generation and what's your current cost per lead acquired in time and money because I want you to think of time in this case because that's another currency and then I want you to then try to measure. If you have lots of time and not enough money then there's things that you do that have a return on investment based on the fact that you, you don't have the money to try it a different way. If you have some money but not the time to spend on something, then you tend to put a bigger investment into something to acquire your lead and you factor that into your costs. What you're looking to find out here with this particular question is, you know, how do I know that this is any better than the other ways I've tried things? Uh, to me, it's find the simple measure you want to go from and decide that, you know, what, how much did it take me to get 10% more on this method, and how much did it take me on this other method, and then whichever one you liked better at the end is the one I'd end up investing more in. Desiree wants to know if you have any tips or suggestions for optimizing your Google Places page. So first off, I have this opinion that Google Places is going to fold into Google Plus really shortly. Um, there's a lot of blog posts written on how to optimize it. One of the things you want to do is you want to make sure that um, all the questions you can imagine somebody asking right out of the gate should be answered there. You should uh, put pictures for sure. Video actually helps push your places ranking higher than other people uh, if you throw a video in to help like with a tour or a walkthrough or an interview or whatever you want to do. Um, using the multimedia opportunities that are available to you via Google is recommended. The other thing is if you, there's sometimes an opportunity to put a bunch of other URLs in there. Uh, resist doing that because I would say that um, the more buttons you give people to click, the uh, paradox of choice kicks in and then people don't click any buttons. Mm. Um, social media for wholesale companies, does that work as well or can it work? Absolutely. So it's the, um, it's the sort of B2B question a slightly different way. Um, there's two ways to do it. It could be the, my favorite marketing trick of ask your doctor about you know, where in which you, the end buyer, the wholesaler sells to a retailer, um, you're asking the retailer's customer to ask your retailer to do such and such. That's one. Two, the retailers are all very heavily into using social presence and you can find them usually as well. Um, there's a lot of organizations doing this. Real estate, uh, the B2B models of real estate are doing this really heavily. Uh, McDonald's Corporation is, is sourcing franchise uh, owners this way. A lot of organizations are looking that way. So there's a lot of precedent for it, so I think it does work very well. Or it could, could we have, stand uh, more. Several, I'm sorry. Uh, we had several questions about attracting people to Twitter and to other social media. And what I kind of heard you say, I didn't hear you use the word relationship, but that it can't just be throwing stuff out there. You actually have to engage with people. 
people are uh, when when you meet somebody in an event, uh, let's say a cocktail party or a chamber meeting or something like that, the person you end up remembering the most favorably turns out not to be the person who said something witty or pithy. It's the person who gave you so much attention that you felt wanted and heard and seen. Um, listening and absorbing other people's information is what always makes somebody walk away going, "Wow, that person is so interesting," and you know you'll get the most incredible compliments and the person won't have realized that they didn't even ask you anything. Um, with attracting people to use social tools, though, I find that the way I have uh, reacted the best to it in, in other organizations is uh, make there be a useful carrot. Uh, Mick Golusky sells comic books in my town. Mick is, sells comics and games and whatnot. Every Wednesday when new comic books come out, Mick sends me a picture of the comics he thinks I should want to buy, not just, hey, look at all these comics. There are ways to sort of personalize uh, your offers and your ideas to the most, you know, your most beloved of your buyers, do that every time you can. Good, good. Um, Peter says his Facebook reach has gone down dramatically in the last month and was told it's due to Facebook throttling and says, do you know what Facebook's plan is for this and their new reach generator? No. Uh, <laughs> let me say that, Peter. <laughs> That's the easy answer. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I would say uh, Google the name Amy Porterfield and Google the name Mari Smith, M-A-R-I Smith. These are the Facebook wizards that I go to with questions like yours, Peter. So find them. They will gladly tell you the answer. We had a question too, Chris, about uh, advertising on the web, like Google AdWords and such. What recommendations do you have? So AdWords works really well for a lot of people. I've, I've seen tons of people have great success uh, doing AdWords campaigns. Facebook ads, man, people tell me they do so great with them. I've never made anything happen with a Facebook ad. I've spent, uh, I haven't spent tons. I've spent a few hundred in tests, and a few hundred can go a really long way if you target your ads very tightly. Um, but I've never had it convert. The best I've had is I've had a bunch of people come to a, a page that I wanted them to like. Um, but getting them to leave Facebook and take an action was really hard for me. Google Plus has no advertising on it right now, but Google owns AdWords, and it stands to reason that there will be you know, mountains of advertising as time goes on. We'll, we'll see how that plays. I think that advertising on the web, uh, banner ads are still where they've always been, which is sub-1% result, and... Um, the other thing to look at, though, that is a huge industry that people aren't taking advantage of because it has sort of a shady past is affiliate marketing, which is um, how do you connect the person? You sell a product, but you don't have the audience. This other person has a huge audience that could use the product. You get that person an affiliate link, uh, and then that person can promote, and then in so doing um, gets a little cut of the sale but the person gets served and everybody's happy. So look into affiliate marketing on the web. It's a, it's a hugely underused setup, and I think there's lots of money to be made on all parts of the equation. And we have somebody that just wants you to kind of give an overview of Google+. Sure. Google Plus is a social network not unlike something like Facebook. It allows you to put updates into a status type bar that allows you to do photo, text, video, location, uh, or some combination of the above. It allows you to share other people's uh, updates if that's of interest to you. And you can, you can find and follow people around your interests. Like I said earlier, you can go to Find People on Plus and just type in a few different types of interests or locale or whatever matters to you and start that way. But there's even a search tool right in Google Plus. There's a little search at the top that lets you look around and see what people are talking about. You know, for example, I'm into music. Uh, I follow a bunch of different bands who are very active on there, and I follow a bunch of uh, music industry types and whatnot. Uh, I like comic books, so I follow some a whole bunch of these writers and artists from comics that you would know the names, like the Batman type comics and all that. Um, Google Plus allows. Hey, Chris, on that note, I think we have to say goodbye, but you know We're what, done, you, have, we? <laughs> you have been great, and thank you so much. I want to remind everybody that our next Fridays with Visage will be Friday, April 13th, with Patrick Ungashik on Succession Strategies. So join us then. Thanks for being here today. Muted.